Well, it looks like my intro just had a little hiccup on it. Good thing I am fast on my feet and able to improvise quickly. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this evening's show, Generally Irritable. I'm Erica Reddick, your host of the show. Super excited to have you guys here tonight because I have a really interesting guest and we're going to have a really interesting conversation. Uh, I, I want to confess right off the bat that this is not a topic that I uh, know tons and tons about. Um, so Paul and I are going to be having really complicated or deep conversations about trusts and endowments and these legal financial instruments that families often use to protect um, their family's wealth and um, things that they've earned and um, and gained over time. Um, it's a way to make sure that in the case of somebody dying that people are taken care of. There's, there's a lot behind it. Endowments, trusts, estates, all of these kinds of things. So I'm an accountant. Um, I know a lot about producing the numbers to do tax returns for these kinds of, of instruments, but I don't know exactly how they work. So I just want to confess that right from the start to you guys. Um, we're going to be having some really interesting conversations. Uh, I'm hoping we're going to have some folks joining us um, in the feed, um, in the comment section, who can help answer questions that we have as we go along. Uh, guys who are actually in the financial industry, who do this for a living, uh, and who have more knowledge than, than you and I do, for sure. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what my guest Paul Ballarand has to say about it. Um, Paul, we're going to have to talk about this. That sounds like a good Viking last name, Valorand. It should be a Viking last name if it's not. But um, so we're going to be talking about his. He has this idea that and that we can fund the government using things, using financial instruments like endowments and trusts, just like large universities uh, do to run their facilities and run their their colleges and universities. So um, I, I'm I'm not going to Paul's going to be able to give us the numbers probably better than me, but, you know, Harvard could probably last forever at infinitum without another dime of tuition if they just operated their uh, funds and endowments to pay for those and fund those kinds of things. So can we fund the government that way? Can we move away? Can we, in a number of generations, move off of having to pay taxes and have the government be funded by trusts and endowments or through this financial system. I think this is a crazy, crazy topic. Um, I told him I thought he was crazy when he told me, um, but I would love to hear about it. I believe the idea is that it doesn't happen all at once, right? We couldn't just suddenly move to this, that we would have to move into the operation. So. I'm going to, I can just like stop speculating and bring Paul into the show with me. What do you guys think? Should we bring Paul in and, and have an expert talk to us? Um, Olga, Olga's already watching girl. I'm ready. Brian, Wright. Good evening. Good evening. How are y'all? Let's, you know what? Let's just bring Paul in. Let's just bring Paul in. Paul, what's going on back there? Good evening, Erica. How are you? I am well, sir. I am really excited. We've already got some of my favorite people chatting with us in the feed tonight. Olga Marr and Brian Wright say hello. Hi, Olga. Hi, Brian. Hello, hello. They're going to... Uh, Olga, my girl, the uh, Libertarian Latina. Well, girl, what is your... Wait, is that what it's called? The Libertarian Latina, right? That's what your page is called? Um Olga Marr is awesome. Go check out her page. Uh, great libertarian woman in Vermont. Are you going to be running for office, Olga? Have you declared that you're running for any office? I know Paul is running for office. Uh, that is now, correct. so Paul, before we get into the nitty gritty of the financial stuff that we're going to be discussing this evening, why don't you take a few minutes to introduce yourself to our viewers? Um, Share a little bit about why, like, uh, uh, you know, why you're passionate about Vermont politics. 
Um, we got to make sure we get all your campaign information in the description and in the comment section too. Absolutely. Don't let me forget that if I don't already have it there. Don't let me forget. Uh, but share a little bit about why you're passionate about Vermont politics and how you came to this idea that we could fund the government using endowments. Sure. So, um, first off, just to, to, uh, cover this, my name is not Norse in origin. It is French. Ah, Oh, you could hear me. You can hear me backstage. I okay, can good. hear you backstage. Good. <laughs> so politics has long been a part of my, my family's um, family conversation often revolves around politics, as I'm sure it does in many families. And so as I got older, I took a keen interest in understanding how the inner workings of government work and how our state is run. I grew up in Vermont. I was born in New Hampshire, but I grew up in Vermont from the age of three. And as I came to be a voting age, I took an interest in getting involved in politics. Now, at the age of 19 or 20, you don't have the experience to be able to bring anything useful to Montpelier, but I kept it in the back of my mind. And so as time went on and we experienced the crash of 2008, and I'm sure that many of us all recall that with some uh, sadness. Yep. It, it came to my attention that what we're doing here in Vermont isn't working. And as I watched inflation start to grow and as I watched prices go up and realized that our state government's answer to all of the problems was either A, throw more money at it or B, do nothing. Um, and, and by throwing more money at it, it meant increasing taxes on everybody. And it, I was thinking about it and I'm like, well, how does it help people? You, you throw money at a problem. And you say you're going to subsidize people's lives, except you tax that sub you, you tax them out of the ability to live without them. And that got the gears turning. Well, as it would happen in 2010, I actually gave up on Vermont and I moved out west. Mm -hmm. And at, out west, I got involved. I was a grocer by by trade. My family's uh, th I was a third generation grocer. Grandfather, father and myself were all grocers. And then uh, I got involved in the finance industry after a particularly long shift at the store I was running. And um, I ended up getting picked up by one of the major banks and I learned finance from the ground up, like literally from the absolute baseline all the way up until I was investment licensed and I was working regularly with people who had any anywhere from people who had not a dime to their name to I think the person I think the wealthiest person I worked with had seventy three million dollars in assets, mostly cash at that point because he sold his business. Mm -hmm. um, and so because I wanted to to progress, I took everything people didn't want to deal with. People in banking, a lot of your retail bankers don't like dealing with trusts. They don't like dealing with estates. They don't like dealing with complex transactions because they take forever and it prevents them from getting the things that make them their bonuses. I decided to, to climb into that and really focus on it. And so I got exposed to a lot of new and interesting things like trusts. And so after doing a lot of research, I so noticed that trusts are another name for a trust can be an endowment. And that's how the colleges like Harvard, the Ivy League schools um, fund a lot of their their grants, their research, things of that nature. But the amount of money they've accumulated over their extensive existence is very large in the billions of dollars. Uh, you can fact check me on that, but I believe Harvard has a multi-billion dollar endowment. Excuse me. And so why the as the as the thought came came up and i was setting up life insurance for myself for the first time and uh, i have a special needs child so i need to make sure that the the insurance money would last him through adult into adulthood at the very least um i was like well why can't we use something very similar to fund government agencies the the trust instrument itself is not complicated when it comes right down to it if you if you organize the language correctly and you form a statute to back it we could very easily fund individual agencies or even the total general fund off of one of these uh, endowments and make it so that we can eventually reduce, we can over time reduce the amount of taxes people have to pay and eventually eliminate the need for taxes altogether. Now, of course, there's a lot of mechanics that go into this and there are probably a lot of unanswered questions that we don't, when it comes to things like that, there's going to be some things that we don't know we don't know, but we, I don't think anyone's ever asked the question. And so that's what I've come up to do. Well, and it's really interesting, you know, when I started 
thinking about this question and asking some friends of mine who are also financial folks, you know, one of the first things they said was, well, would it be the whole government? Would it be the state government? Would it be, you know, whatever? And I was like, oh gosh, I don't really know. That's a really good question. And, and so you already answered one of my questions, which is how, what would be the structure of, of something? Like, what do you imagine as the starting point? And I think what you said was starting with individual agencies. And so if Correct. we could do something like, um, and I'm, I'm just spitballing here. So, uh, nobody is allowed to hold this against me. I'm just literally making stuff up. So <laughs> like if we wanted to start with like the department of health and human services or, uh, name, name an agency in Vermont, we could start. So with. What, let's name an easy one to work with. Let's start with the agency okay. of education. Okay. Perfect. So, and I know education is very important to everybody, particularly if you have children. Correct. Um, so one of the biggest complaints we get about education, and I've got another campaign, part of my platform is also on reforming education and making it so that we can get better outcomes for the money we spend in education and possibly yes. even reduce the spend for a better outcome. And I can get into that later if we have time. Um, but the idea is, the agency of education gets X number of dollars a year in funding. Does the agency of education use every penny of that funding? Not really. No, no agency can go through its entire budget effectively in a given year. There's just too many and, moving and anybody, parts. Yeah, and anybody that has worked uh, for the state or federal government or a nonprofit or a bureaucracy of any kind, you know that at the end of the year, you're told if you don't spend the money that you've already been allotted, you're going to have your budget reduced. And that incentivizes managers to spend money unnecessarily on things that they don't need. Correct. And that is why step number one is to stop that practice. Mm. We no longer reduce budgets based on unspent funds. Instead, we incentivize the part or agencies to spend wisely and mm. save where they can without reducing services. The leftover money at the end of the year gets put into this endowment, into this trust. And the specific wording of the trust will need some will will need professional attorneys to look at that, people who are actually specialized in the field of forming trusts. Mm. Um, because if you word it wrong, trusts are possibly the most powerful instrument when it comes to um having things done the way you want. Because even can, over, oh, I'm sorry, for interest. So this is what, when you say powerful, um, even over wills, contracts, yes. Yes. Um, you can have a will and you can have a contract or whatever. And that can stuff to go, can go to probate or court or whatever, and still be disregarded by the court. But in the case of trusts, they really are well protected differently. Yes. Now there are there are provisions in every state that can override a trust generally if the trust is underfunded. Mm. However, generally speaking, even a judge has a hard time breaking that shell that the trust has around it. More importantly, if you look at trust law, now I'm going to preface, I am not an attorney, I'm not licensed to practice law in any of the 50 states. <laughs> I am just very well experienced in this particular type of instrument. If you look at the law, under trust law it says this thing affects trusts unless the trust itself says it doesn't. Wow. Do you have any idea? I, I, I should have had a lawyer on hand. I didn't even think about that um, to answer some questions. But do you know why trusts are so different? Why? Like, what is it about this instrument, legal financial instrument that is so well protected? So if you look back at the history of where trusts originate, or things that would become trusts. They're actually ancient. They mm. are an artifice of the feudal era. Oh. If, you look, if you look at the Duchy of Cornwall, as an example, the Duchy of Cornwall is actually a trust. Okay. And, and inside of that trust are lands and investments, and that's what, um, that's what pays the income of the Duke of Cornwall, who happens to be the Prince of Wales. Mm-hmm. And so, and the same with the Duchy of Lancaster, who, which is where the personal income of the Queen of England comes from. Both are trusts and both are feudally originated. That's where these came from. And as we separated from Great Britain, which had moved out of the feudal era for the most part by the time we became a thing, um, we utilized that artifact 
in order to create an, a, an indenture that would allow us to protect assets in the same way that the old feudal lords and ladies would. And it hmm. still works today. And the reason that it stays the way it is is because it ain't broke, so we ain't going to fix it. Hmm. Um, a similar <coughs> artifice from, from those times would be the landlord-tenant relationship that I'm sure many of us have. Mm, yep. We definitely do not have protections as landlords, though. Uh, no. We don't have those protect. Not at least not in Burlington. But I digress. I could go off on a tangent over here. Um. So, go ahead though. Finish. No, no, no. Go ahead. I you were you were about to say something, and I unintentionally interrupted. Oh, I was just gonna say. Uh, Brian said, um, I believe the federal agency responsibility should re be returned back to the states. And as Vermont is five trillion in debt, these responsibilities should be handled by local citizens and communities. And Brian, you, I, you know, it's so funny to me, and I don't know if you experience this when you're out talking to people about this, Paul, but if you're a politician and you say stuff like, oh, abolish the Fed, or we should get rid of the Federal Department of Education, people are like, oh my God, you're a heretic. How dare you? You're a terrible person. Oh, you hate the children. You want them to die. You know, they say wild stuff, right? But, it's but any teacher, just as an example, because we, we were talking about the Department of Education a little bit. Any teacher I know will tell you that No Child Left Behind was one of the worst pieces of legislation to affect schools and make things worse. And you'll even hear and you'll hear people in healthcare talk about how all these federal laws that regulate things make it, you know, more expensive, harder to do patient care, less able to whatever. I mean, I I hear I feel like I hear more bad than good about the feds being in charge of things. And you would be correct, because when it comes to the federal government, the federal government has this nasty habit of being a hammer and assuming everything's a nail. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they think that things that work in New York City are going to work in Barrie, Vermont. Yes. Both things are incorrect. And so that's where being able to fund government by endowment, breaking it down. And when I said agency of education, I meant the Vermont agency of education, not the U.S. Department of true, Education. True, true. U.S. Department of Education needs to disappear. Then Educate. we can go away. We'll, and then we can use an endowment to fund the Vermont Department of Education. Correct. And then and we don't need to be dependent on the federal government, which invariably comes with strings attached. Absolutely. And so there's a, there's a lot of pieces that go into that. And on top of funding individual agencies within the state, each locality, each municipality should be able to fund itself in a similar manner using the same techniques. So if... If Barrytown or if Burlington or if um, Essex form an endowment so that their excess tax dollars from property taxes or sales taxes go into it, because I know a lot of these jurisdictions have option tax, then the excess funds can go into that endowment to start to perpetuate the funding of the town or the municipality without having to raise property taxes, which is even more important now because the housing market is completely bonkers. And I believe that's a technical term I have used with customers. That's a legal term. <laughs> I don't legal. It's a technical term. It's a technical term. So full disclosure, I work in insurance right now, including homeowners. And that is a term I have used. I say the market's bonkers and bonkers. we don't know how much it's going to cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so. So how big, if you, I don't know if you can give us a scale, but um, like how big would an endowment have to be to fund one of these departments of education or whatever have you done the math on any of that like what would be required to fund uh any of these departments or things i have not done the raw math on it but if we can find the budget for one of these agencies i can tell you yeah i i would love that let's see let's see um okay like really like right now we could do that yeah let's do it live right here okay okay budget for vermont department Oh, uh, looks good. like we only have back to 2019. Wait, well, hey, that's something. Here, let me, I'll share so, my screen. Let's see. I don't care okay. what they're spending it on right now. I want to know what the total dollar amount is. Let's see. All right. If anybody knows it offhand, you can throw it in the, uh, in the chat. 
Does it say? Are they going to make it easy for us? Data I'm not reporting? I'm looking at the report now. I'm not seeing a total number. I'm seeing it Annual broken down. Report and budget book. Maybe we should start with something easier. <laughs> Hang on. They're, 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 it looks like their primary operating budget is $25 million. Oh, wow. Or $28 million. We'll call it $28 million just for the sake of argument. Let's do okay. that. Okay. Okay. So most of your investments in an endowment, they're going to be in what they call investment grade bonds, mutual funds, or blue chip stocks. Okay. Um, now, I need to, again, stipulate I am not currently a financial advisor. I have been licensed as, a financial advi as an investment advisor representative before. This is not to be construed as financial advice. <laughs> yes, Believe sir. me, Finra will get very angry if I don't stipulate that. <laughs> yeah, that is we're we are no one is claiming to have all the answers here. So don't ideally, arrest us. So let's let's say for the sake of argument that the budget has to be twenty five million dollars. Okay. A well managed portfolio, and I'm going to put it this in there of non voting securities and bonds. Okay. Because we don't want to that's allow safe. The, right. We don't want to allow the government a vote on how businesses are run. That is a really yes, correct. And just um, in case, does in ca it, just to make sure everybody understands that if you're not a financial advisor person like we are, explain to folks what you mean by voting and non-voting. Okay, so there are two primary classifications of stocks. A stock okay. is an ownership. Uh, we we call them equities. It is an ownership stake in a company by share. A share, is, uh, a share can be, or a company can be broken into any number of shares, and you can own any number of these shares, which gives you a certain amount of power within that company. Now, preferred stock operates off of a particular, what they call a power value, a fixed value, and you earn a, a dividend, which is money from the company for when they are profitable, based on a percentage of what that power value is. Almost universally, the power value is $100. And the the percentage that is the uh, dividend is often between four and six percent. So for the sake of argument, we'll call it five. Okay, hold on. You're getting way too much into the weeds. Let's make Sorry. it really simple. Nobody cares okay. about. Well, okay. actually, you know what? Hold on. I was going to interrupt you because I was like, this is boring. Who cares about dividends? But now I'm realizing, wait, this is actually really important. Yes, this is because relevant. because that we need it to earn interest and dividends and why all that matters. Correct. Right. Okay. So this is all an important part of the conversation. Okay. Keep going. Yes. So I'm going to apologize in advance to those of you who, yeah. who look at the numbers and you just kind of glass over your eyes because I know most people do. I did when I started out, but yeah, I'm try to I find this interesting. Yeah. Like let's everybody um, take a deep breath. <sighs> okay. We're going to nerd out with Paul here for a minute. I'll try to barrel through it as clearly and as quickly advising. as possible. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go. So the, the here's the thing about preferred stock. They are non-voting. No matter mm. how much preferred stock you have, they get zero vote in what the company does or who sits on the board of directors. Okay. The other form of stock is the stock most of us probably have in our 401ks or other retirements and possibly in our portfolios, and that's common stock. Common stock gets dividends based on what the company releases per, per share. It can be mm. anywhere between zero and several dollars. On average, you'll find that it's like a dollar, a quarter, or something like that per share for a lot of your stocks. But you get to vote on who sits on that board of directors, mm -hmm. and you get to vote on who runs the company. And if you get enough of your friends together, and you're all shareholders, and you can outvote yep. the other shareholders, you can control the board. Yep. And we don't want government having that power because there, there are actual other terms for governments with that kind of power. <laughs> <laughs> that you're not allowed to say on social media. Um, no, but in all seriousness, that is a really important thing that you point out there, Paul, and probably something uh, a lot of people would be afraid of. So um, if government has control over the means of production, um, that is not free market. Uh, that is not a free market. And so we, it, to, to be, this is a really cool idea we just don't want the government to be able to uh, pick winners and losers like like the bankers do, right? So we've seen this, I think, um, 
really this year, I don't know if you can speak to this at all, Paul, but Benjamin, was it? Oh my God. You know what? The last couple of years are all just blending together now. Was yeah, it last year? It. The, uh, the stock, the Reddit stock people that bought all the stuff. Was that 2021? That was 2021. Yeah. When they were, when like, uh, the GameStop and the AMC and stuff like that. Yep. And basically the, the little guy figured out how to manipulate the market the same way the high priced bankers have been doing it for years and years and years. That's that wasn't market manipulation. That was taking advantage of a couple of hedge funds who thought they knew better than everyone else. And someone caught on. Yes. Um, and so for, to, to kind of jump into that for just a moment, because I yeah. think it's relevant and I am. Yeah, going, because we don't want the government to be able to do what correct. they did. So full disclosure, I was an ape. An I was ape. one of the people who jumped into GameStop in order to take down this very corrupt hedge fund. Wait, what's an, why guerrilla warfare or something? Is I don't know where the term comes from. If you ever ape? go onto r slash Wall Street Bets, those of us on there tend to, and I don't post on Wall Street Bets, but I love watching Wall Street Bets. Okay. Um, the most self-deprecating group of people you have ever met in your life. Like... They, they're like, we, I'm an ape and I love the stock. That's all there is to it. And that's all they said. Um, if, if you ever want to see people insult themselves more, go to yeah. r slash Wall Street Bets. It's oh an my amazing goodness. place. They are silly. Okay. So, okay. Um, so, so these guys, so explain a little bit about it. And so, I, I'm, I don't, I'm, I do not begrudge. Let me just be clear. I do not begrudge these guys for doing what they did. I think that if you can figure out a way to, to, work within the system for your if you figure out how to play the game play it okay yep. i more power to you however the government should not be able to do it so okay go now you can explain it so what happened was is there was a there was a hedge fund whose name escapes me at this moment who had decided that they were going to short gamestop and what that means is they are going to borrow stocks from someone sell them Mm. and then buy something called a call, betting that the stock will go down. The call allows them to force another the person they bought the call from to sell at a fixed price, no matter what the price of that stock is. And in so doing, they can make money. So what they were mm. doing is they were, they were using the system in order to try and cause GameStop to go down in price. And it was working. And a lot of these hedge fund managers or people participating in hedge funds as one of their... their um, the management team will often go on mainstream media site, uh, mainstream media newscasts and talk about various stocks and say, well, this looks weak for that reason, or this looks wrong for a different reason. And that actually does legally manipulate the market because they're just going on there giving their professional opinion, but they, they have that opinion because they technically have a stake in it. And so I, one guy who's, uh, name on Reddit is deep effing value. And yes, I'm censoring that so that you don't get kicked off of any of your streams. Saw the stock and he looked at GameStop's financial. He's like, something ain't right here. So he dug into it. And then he went on r slash Wall Street bets. And he's like, guys, I think someone's effing with the market here. We, I, I'm buying this stock. You do what you want to. But this stock is undervalued by a lot. And so all of r slash Wall Street bets jumped in. And it became a meme war with one of the biggest hedge funds that ever existed. And what ended up happening is, is that the apes bought up a huge amount of stock, not caring if they, if they lost money or not, like they considered the money, we considered the money spent. It's like, this is not an investment. We're spending money because these people are evil and they're manipulating the market. And it caused GameStop to spike. And that whole hedge fund literally dissolved under the weight of its own, own foolishness because they deliberately over shorted the stock beyond the number of shares that even existed and so they could as long as the games the apes held their shares they couldn't buy shares to pay off the people they owed and they completely wiped out oh erica you're muted thank you for that this is one of the things why you know for those of us that consider ourselves on the conservative side right uh right of center there seems sometimes to be confusion about why 
our opposition does not like free market, does not like capitalism and, and things like that. And it's these those kinds of, of scenarios that you described that make people lose faith in our system. The fact that these wealthy elitists can 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 bet against a company causing it to go out of business not because of something that they did bad business practices bad management uh you know not being integrous with their word or whatever it's not that no it's just some buttholes on wall street deciding that they can make money by tanking someone else's business so i'm actually going to stop you there the value of the stock does not directly influence the amount of business the company's doing it's quite the opposite business practices are supposed to affect the market value of the stock well right but that's so, what i'm saying so if even people if can bet against it cent, okay go ahead sorry even if that stock were to reach one cent it would not affect the daily financials of of gamestop because unless they tried to sell more shares directly out of their their stock treasury or issue more shares it's not going to affect their business practices and that's why deliberately undervaluing a stock is a really dumb practice because it's going to come up and bite you in the tail end which is exactly what happened to this hedge fund someone's going to catch on because they are not as smart as they think they are mm -hmm. and what this was was a was a a lesson to some of these hedge fund managers that you need to be honest because someone's going to catch on and there are enough angry people, especially after a pandemic where we've been locked in our homes for two years that are going to look at things and go, I just got a whole bunch of money from the government. That's going to get inflated out of control because they're handing us money for no reason. So screw it. YOLO. And that's literally what they said. <laughs> and I hate the term YOLO. Like I'm a carpe diem <laughs> guy. I prefer the classics, but that's what they were doing. No, I just got a $1,200 stimmy YOLO. And I mean, you know how many people I know either did stuff like bought stocks like that or guns? Yeah. Killed like, me. yeah, yeah. Most people that I know were not. Anyway, that's that is a side note. OK, let's get back to the topic at hand. Yeah. Sorry, so the point is, the point is that there are weird instruments and legal ways that other people who have way more knowledge than you and I can manipulate the stock market. Yes. And and if we were to move to a model where where the government was funded by trusts slash endowments slash the stock market, um, they we we would have to be really careful about um, not allowing them to manipulate the market. So we would ha there would definitely have to be some parameters, I would think, about like what so, kinds of instruments they could get into. Correct. Um, what le like when they can buy and sell maybe um because uh, again like let's say you know you you we look at the cir circumstances we were just talking about with GameStop then you have people like Elon Musk who can tweet a word and then everybody goes and buys the stock oh God, so you in theory you know the department of education could go oh we're going to buy I don't know, something for our endowment or, you know, we don't like you guys anymore. So we're going to sell all our stock from the endowment. Yeah. So, so that could be funky, right? That can be funky, but here's where this is, this is why we limit what instruments they can buy. This is why common stock cannot be allowed to be owned by government along with the voting rights. The, the things you see going up and down on the stock market are almost universally common shares. Oh, okay. You have to know where to look to find preferred shares. And even as someone who is a professional in the industry, very rarely could I find preferred shares on open market. Like you, you have to know what you're looking for. Interesting. And yes, you can do it, but in all likelihood, you're going to end up going after. If you if you like type in Google on on a stock market ticker, you're getting their common share. You're not getting any preferred shares. And I, and I okay. don't even know if Google has preferred shares issues. But for the sake of argument, let's say they do. Yeah. You're, you're not likely to find it on open market. Um. The thing that the government needs to mostly be invested in is bonds. Mm, so long bond term. Correct. Low risk. Okay. So what a bond is, for those of you who don't know, it is a debt instrument. A company issues a bond that's worth $1,000. And they, you as a consumer purchase the $1,000 bond off the company. And let's say the bond is a 5% bond, which means it pays 5% yield every single year. The bonds are always 30-year instruments. Hmm. 
So the bond is available on the open market and, is, and their price is not affected by buy and sell. It's affected by interest rates. So as the Fed raises the interest rate, the bond prices will go down based on the interest rate. It's if the interest rate goes down, the bond interest, uh, the bond price goes up. This is called buying discount or premium bonds. I'm not going to get into the weeds in that. That's a lot more complicated, but that's the simplified version. The thing is, no matter where the price of the bond is, if you hold it for all 30 years, you give it back to the company and they're still obligated to pay you $1,000. Yeah. So the bond might only be worth $500 on the open market, but if you're in your last six months and you go and give that bond back to the company, they're still obligated to give you $1,000. Plus, you've also earned all 30 years at 5%. Yeah, interest so, the whole time. Yep. Okay. Correct. So the idea is, and we can do this with preferred stocks too. It's a little more touchy there because it's a little more volatile. And preferred stocks don't, a bond, they're required to pay on. A yes. preferred stock, they are not. Right. So like as an example, if you buy some kind of stock uh, or ownership, we'll call it ownership equity in a company, whether it's in the form of stocks or bonds. If that company goes uh, out of... Pause. A bond is not ownership. Oh. Only stocks are... Only preferred and common shares are, oh, are ownerships. Oh, because it's a debt instrument. Correct. You are becoming oh. a lender. You do not own. You have a lien on them. Oh, fast. Oh my gosh. Go... Why, didn't I re... Why didn't I think of that till just... Why didn't I realize that? And then if they go out of business, the bondholders are the first people the to get debt, paid. Right. The debt gets paid out first before the equity. Correct. And this is where this becomes important because uh, if a company goes bankrupt or goes belly up, all their assets are sold. Okay. But debts get paid first. Right. That includes all bonds. Then preferred shares get paid out. Then common shares get paid out. Right. The, the benefit to being a common share is you get a vote in who runs the company. The downside is you're the last people to get money if things go belly up. So I apologize for interrupting. No, no, that's good. Thank you for th that is what um, that is when I said I told you and if I say something crazy, interrupt me and correct me. So we don't they can't call it. They can't call us liars. Um, so, OK, so we have them invest in bonds. It's a debt instrument. It's safer, first to be paid out, consistent, usually consistent uh, dividend payout, interest payout. Interest payout. Um, now, we, let if we go back, is $25 million budget too big to start with? Should we start with a smaller number to try to do math? No, I think $25 million is a good number to look okay. at because they need to see this at scale. Right, like an actual agency. Like Correct. what that would look like. So if we start out with the Department of Education, Vermont, who, uh, from what we can tell, the 2019 budget was 25 million. So that's yep. what that's our premise that we're starting with. So we would first. Would we have to make 25 million dollars first or so tell me how you're figuring the math here so currently assuming that their budget actually is 25 million we're going to use that because it's a nice round number to work with okay what you're looking for is for the trust to, to produce at least 25 million dollars a year mm -hmm. oh in if, interest or in, in dividends in interest and dividends and um, we'll call it um revenue okay 25 million in revenue because there's all kinds of instruments instruments you can use for that. So it needs to generate 25 million in revenue. If the average portfolio generates 5% uh, off of its investments, that means that that particular endowment must have at least $500 million in it. Interesting. You know what is fascinating at first, when you first said that, I was like, oh my God, $500 million, golly. And but then I remember- that's a drop in the bucket. I know. <laughs> Then I remembered how stupid our budgets are and everything yes. else. Um, oh, my goodness. Brian, uh, hold on. Brian, is our debt in Vermont really $5 trillion? I, I, I want to fact check on that because I don't. We've had a. That's the he posted that I that I that is crazy. Um, I wouldn't be completely surprised by that. I think Burlington alone is in debt millions and millions of dollars like hundreds so, of millions of dollars 
So actually, no, the state of Vermont has maintained a stable debt profile. A net total net tax supported debt outstanding was $678.6 million from VermontTreasurer.gov. Now, is that, does that include like unfunded uh, uh, pensions and stuff like that? Uh, I couldn't tell you offhand. I just, I, I Google searched it and I found it on their website. That would take some digging, oh, but I'll drop it in cool. our, um, our stream chat so you can drop it on Facebook. Okay, cool. Yeah. And that's what Brian said. He cool. thought it's what the debt clock says. The uh, debt clock. I thought the debt clock was only for the U S I don't know. Let's see. Does it show both? Does it show the States? Oh my God. If anybody hasn't ever looked at this, hold on. I got to share this with our viewers. Oh, there is one. So this is the U S debt clock in case, in case you guys have never seen this before. Um, you can see our national debt is this first, uh, quadrant over here. Can everybody see that? Okay. Do I need to like make it bigger? Is that helpful? National debt. So what is that? Uh, that is $29 trillion. And I believe that is not including the unfunded social security and Medicare, which is absolutely disgusting. It's, it is mind boggling. Do they have it for the States? They do have one for the state. And I believe that's where Brian's getting it. And that's what it says. It's 4.5 trillion. What's the website? Uh, here I'll post it. Okay. Oops. Oh, for Pete's sake. That Alt is tab wild. there, Paul. Come on. Yeah, so anybody who's never seen this before, go to usdebtclock.org. Look at the various numbers on here because as you can see, it's not just talking about the debt. It'll also show you the debt by like person, how much is defense, how much is social security. Um, it's showing amount of people unemployed, um, manufacturing jobs available, the population, uh, things like that. So the thing about the debt clock is I don't know where they get their information and it does not jive with what is on the government, the state website. Yeah. Well, so, and that's, here's the thing. And I'm not saying this is what ha what's happening, right? So this is what you have to do on social media. Now you can't set, you have to, everything is allegedly, yep. everything is allegedly. Uh, but I do know as a matter of, um, in for a point of order, point of fact, uh, the city of Burlington, their financial statements are garbage and they literally hide their debt. Um, so if you try to really do a review of the financial statements for the city of Burlington, um, all of the debt actually isn't in one place and they do not make note of unfunded mandates. So I would be willing to bet that the, that the Vermont budget does not include unfunded mandates for pensions and things like that, um, that they say. So I'm not saying that Brian's wrong. I'm not saying any of these websites are wrong. I'm just saying, Might don't the let them the fool you. They like to, it's called lying by omission. They just like happen to forget certain numbers that they should add. Um, oh, this is fascinating. I wonder where they get this information from. We should find out. Um, population 667,000. Uh, and we have 490,000 registered voters. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that seem four, strange? We have 490,000 registered voters in a, in a 650,000 uh, pop. Correct. That doesn't surprise me at all. No. No, our population's aging so so much that we're actually expecting to be 25% elderly by 2030. Oh, wow. Well, I know that's not what it is. It's just that we're our, our voter rolls have not been cleaned up at all. Uh, well, no, there's that too. But <laughs> even so, children don't stay in Vermont. Young people do that not stay true. in Vermont. If they're, they're leaving. If they're, they, either they leave as soon as they get out of high school or as soon as they get out of college. And the ones who come here for college stay here for college and get out because they realize there's not a job to be found here that's going to be worth the salt for the price of living here. Relative cost of living in Vermont has been so out of control that children and young people like I did back in 2010 are getting out of Dodge to go to places where it's easier to live. Correct. And we if had, they do, go ahead. we had half a dozen families leave our church in one year. 
um, leaving for states with lower cost of living. You know, they were young, young families, folks probably our age, 30s, 40s, saying, you know, we want to be able to raise kids or we want to have more kids or, um, you know, there's just not jobs in my industry where I can move up the ladder and make more mm -hmm. money. And so they're just leaving. That's right. And the reason is because the way we have organized our, our state culture and our state's regulations make it hard for businesses to thrive and grow. The expectation that a business is going to be able to, th to, to grow from the ground up in Vermont is it, it's a joke, to be frank with you. Yeah. Uh, and I work for a small business. I work for a small agency. I work for a small business owner. And even pre-pandemic, pre it, wasn't, it wasn't great. And yeah. during the pandemic, it became a real struggle at times. Well, and, and this is... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. And, um, and if you're not selling something that is quite literally recession proof, like insurance, if you're selling a good or a service that is optional by any stretch of the imagination or might be replaced by a substitute good from Walmart, for those of you who don't know what a substitute good is, it's, it's buying something that's cheaper, even at lower quality than you could buy for more, a higher price from a higher quality producer, like an artisan because you can't afford the higher quality product. Now, of course, that's kind of a catch 22 because the higher quality product is going to last three times as long as the discount product. But when you need something yesterday, no one cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Speaking of nobody cares, I just want to take a moment to thank today's show, uh, to show today's show's sponsor, it's our book, Reasons to Trust the Government. Benjamin and I are sponsoring our show. Yay! Okay, everybody, hold I've, on. We're going to say... Go ahead. I've got a, is it blank? Everyone should read the preview. That's all I'll say. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let me share my screen. Uh, yes, it is. I'm just going to give it away. It is totally blank, uh, because there are no reasons to trust the government. That is what we believe. Um, in all seriousness, it's, it's interesting to have these conversations that we're having today, Paul, where we're talking about, you know, how do we fund a government that we recognize in some ways as being necessary, right? I think there yep. are some things that we can all agree uh, unless you're an anarcho-capitalist, even my really staunch libertarian friends will admit that there are services that may be better provided by a uh, collective, such as the government. But we know that they get too big. They get too big for their britches. They get too much power. And when the government gets so big that it overtakes the, the power of the individual then it's gone too far. And so, yep. you know, we just see so many circumstances in history where uh, whatever it was that was bad that happened was the government. It was either sanctioned by the government or, um, well, it was sanctioned by the government. It was law, whether it was Jim Crow, slavery, um, whether it was, uh, you know, the, the things that went on in Europe, earlier this century or earlier last century, um, that was government taking control, picking winners and losers, deciding who's good and who's bad, who's worthy of living or dying, who's worthy of having a job or not. And so, and so we just, you know, when we were, we were joking around and we were reflecting and I said, you know, especially, uh, you know, I just said, you know, I said, I, I literally do not understand why anyone at this point trusts the government when you look back at history. And anyone who reads history shouldn't trust the government. Precisely. And so and so we just said, you know what, we're you know, I said, we're going to make a We're going to make a book. It's going to be a joke. It's going to be called Reasons to Trust the Government. And it's going to be blank. So uh, in all seriousness, though, folks, you can look at the preview. It shows you like the acknowledgments and stuff. Um, those are the only pages that have words on them. <laughs> I can send you the link. So yes, yeah, so I put the link in the put the link in the description. So um, it's awesome. It's beautiful. We had a good friend, a friend, to help with the uh, the image design. Uh, it's beautiful. Really, what it is meant to do is to be put on your coffee table or on your bookshelf or somewhere where somebody 
particularly um, that you want to open up the conversation with is going to see it. They're going to pick it up and they're going to say, what do you mean there's no reasons to trust the government? It's a great joke book um, for white elephant parties, for birthdays. Um, it makes a great notebook. That's what we use it for. We carry it around and use it uh, to take notes and journal um, and just share that. You know, we believe that people need to be self-governing and take that responsibility. What's that? I'm going to put the commercial link in the thing. I thought you said it wasn't ready yet. It might be. It's a, it's a rough draft. It's good enough. Okay. Well, I'll, well, we can play it at the end of the show. Right. Are you gonna Are you gonna load it somewhere that Send I can play it from? Me. Where is it on YouTube? I'll send, it to you. send me the link. Okay, we made a commercial. It's absolutely ridiculous. We'll play it at the end of the show. Okay. Okay. All right. So enough of the pitch. But in all seriousness, if you guys like my show, if you like the show, if you like the content that we provide, it's a great way to support the channel. You can go to Amazon.com. Reasons to trust the government. It's nine ninety nine. Um, and it's a fun way to troll your family. One of our friends put it on the coffee table or on the end table in the in their spare bedroom when their in-laws came to visit. And he said that they are very, very liberal. And uh, so it's a fun way to, um, to, to start some conversation. So, and support the channel. All right, so enough of that. Let's see. Okay. You can wait. Is that you? Is that the link for the book or the commercial? Commercial. It's on the website. Mm -mm. The book link is on the chat. Okay. There's a link for the commercial that I sent to you. Personally. Oh, in Facebook. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, yeah, so you can go to ericareddick.com for a link to the book. Okay. Back to funding the government with trusts and endowments. What, what are some questions that I haven't asked you yet that I should have? The question is, one of the questions is how long will this take? Oh, good question. Yes. So here's the thing. And this is something that tends to cause politicians to be short sighted mm. and causes people to po a year in politics is a really long time. Yeah. Here's the problem with any plan that actually works. It takes longer than an election cycle. People don't like hearing that. But <laughs> things in Vermont, for example, did not break overnight. They did not break in one election cycle. That's true. They broke over the course of 30 years. Mm. It's going to probably take nearly that long to fix them. And people are going to have to be willing mm. to understand that and accept that that's going to be the case. Same thing with funding government without having taxes be a thing anymore. It's not going to happen in one or two election cycles. This is a multi-generational task. Okay. I have estimated it to take three to four generations, depending on the agency. What, is in a order gener to what does a generation mean? Like, what? how... When you say a generation, how long would you say that is? Uh, the average generation is calculated at about 20 to 25 years. So okay. you're talking 75 to 100 years before this is completely instantiated and all taxes are completely eliminated. And what, where did you, how did you come to that estimate? So I was looking at the numbers of how long it would take to build one of these trusts and I made some estimates and... To be honest, I have not calculated it down to the dollar because there's too many variables. Mm. Um, I'm I'm not stupid, but I'm not smart <laughs> enough to be able to calculate that that far out. And yeah. there's any number of factors that we may not know even exist until we run into them. Uh, an old adage I like to joke is, we'll burn a bridge when we come to it. Um, so here's the issue with how long it takes. Let's say you've got that $25 million budget and that particular agency only spends $24.5 million. The other $500,000 goes into the endowment. That endowment makes 5%. That's $25,000 that first year. You split it in half. The agency gets an extra twelve five. dollars The other twelve five dollars gets rolled back into the endowment to reprincipal so it constantly grows. Okay. That twelve five dollars to the agency is additional money in their budget, but we need to reduce the money that they're dependent on somehow. So... We split that split that twelve five and a half again, and for the just for the sake of this conversation, we'll call it seven. I know it's a little less than that, but seven thousand is removed from the amount of money they get from the state. Now that's not a lot of money, but it grows every single year. Plus, any unspent money from year two also goes back into the endowment. So if they only go through, let's say they they save a quarter of a million this year because they were able to hire someone and it costs X number of dollars to support that infrastructure, it's still growing. And then they would have an incentive to mind their budget so that they could make sure. So I think there has to be a, 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 
an element where over over each year some chunk right you're going to lose a percentage of your budget every year because we're going to take that piece and we're going to put it in this endowment and so then they have an incentive to not spend all their money to be better with their budget to not go overboard like some agencies have a tendency of doing um they're gonna have to tighten their belt correct well it's not even tightening the belt it's don't spend money in an effort to get the same budget next year when you don't need to spend the money. How many times have you heard of agencies buying some extra chairs to make sure they get the same amount of money next year because they've got $100,000 yep. that they couldn't spend because they couldn't hire that manager they've been looking for? Yep. And that was salary money. And well, that's and oftentimes these same agencies will have the I'm just going to I'm just I'm going to say the unpopular thing, but when this when state employees have access to better health care than the average Vermonter. When they have higher salaries and benefit packages than the average Vermonter, I have a problem with that. And so, but I think when they have an unlimited checkbook, you know, they, they're, they're very comfortable being generous with other people's money. So I agree with you in part and I disagree with you in part. Okay. I believe, I believe the state should be required to pay the market rate for any particular position. Okay. Market rate, I could I could agree with. So if you are a ten year IT professional, the average if in the average salary for that particular position is one hundred and twenty thousand, I have no problem with the state paying them one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. That being said. The state should not be a goal for everyone to work for, which in the state of Vermont, it is because that's the only place you can earn a quote unquote livable wage in the state. Well, and that's the thing is it's the 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 government bureaucracy is so big that it's sucking the money out of the marketplace, basically. Yes. Like you're trying to go get a job for the state because all the other jobs have left, but it's because that the government is taking so much of everybody's money that they're leaving. Yep. So it's sort of this like cycle yes. that we create. So, and, and because of that, we keep raising taxes, but of course you can't really raise income taxes because the people they want to target with income taxes don't live in the state. They live in other states and they visit here with their skis. So this is why trying to increase taxes on the rich in Vermont doesn't work because we don't have a whole lot of rich here. Well, and, and most of them are in government. It, f and I think uh, a few weeks ago I had on Julie Marks from the Vermont Short-Term Rental Association. Mm -hmm. And she said Vermont has the highest uh, number of vacation homes per capita in the country. Yep. So more of our land is owned by not Vermonters than yep. any other state in the union. That is correct. Which is wild to me. And so then, so, and I, my understanding is some municipalities um, actually also removed property tax requirements for out-of-state property See, owners. That should not be allowed. And my, my, now, this is my understanding. I have to, I'm not sure of exactly which ones they are, but my understanding is some of the resort areas literally stopped collecting property taxes and i just thought to myself wait a second i like everybody has to if if that's not fair then that property could be owned by a vermonter who would pay property taxes and then we would have enough money for things like what are you talking about now i i don't know if that's actually the case i had not heard that before yeah but if that's the case those municipalities need to realize that what they're doing is they're pushing vermonters out of their municipality and if that's their goal if they're trying to push them into like little apartments so that they can use that we have that land be purchased by rich out-of-staters mm -hmm. they need to be voted out of office yesterday uh, i'm just saying um, there are a lot of weird rules and laws that are very confusing to me as far as property rights in the state of Vermont and what you can and cannot do. Yep. Um, I think it's very weird. So in, so would we have to hire a team of lawyers and, and like bankers, do you think to run these trusts, uh, to set them up, 
what would the scale be for some would we replace like a department in the state with a with a bunch of lawyers and bankers how did, how do you no. have any idea how the administrative part would go so first off I, I i'd like to throw in how many lawyers and bankers do you think are actually in our government now oh my god a lot so and, and i say this as a former banker who's running for office <laughs> um so what we could do is we could create an arm of the treasury of the vermont treasurer's department that was made up of fund managers and fund management to this day is very heavily regulated okay and they earn a salary based on a percentage of assets under management mm. and the benefit to being a fund manager for the government is job security and the downside could be well maybe you earn a lesser percentage for the total amount of assets under management you deal with but you don't have to deal with all the risks that are involved in running say a hedge fund because hedge fund managers are heavily bought into their funds believe it or not Okay. They don't get off scot-free if that fund goes completely. Not only okay. do they earn a percentage of assets under our management, they're oftentimes one of the major investors in them. Well, these fund managers would not be a major investor. And even if they only earn a quarter percent of what the assets under management of the fund are, that's still a crap load of money. So yes. the nothing to scoff at for sure. Right. So they're going to be fine. And we could even and, and I'm not a fan of salary caps. But even if we were to cap their salary at some reasonable amount, it could still be in the million, a million dollars a year. And it wouldn't even take money out of the pockets of the of the um, agency that those funds were funding. Wow. This is so interesting. Okay. So we need to know, um, anybody who's watching, any of our viewers, what do you have for questions? Is there anything that I missed or that we haven't discussed that you have questions about remember this is always a two-way conversation we want to hear from you what are your questions um yes olga said towns can raise funds for what we need emergency services etc so paul one of the things in my mind i'm imagining that this that there should be some kind of a budget reduction conversation with this like when Okay, let me back up. I'm just thinking about the federal government, right? Yep. In how they spend so much money on things that I just really don't think that uh, we should spend money on. Uh, next next week, uh, next week's show, I'm going to be covering uh, Rand Paul's annual Festivus. We're going to look at the list of stupid stuff that our government spent money on. And how nonsense it is. I remember one time reading it and it was like they uh, there was a study on the viscosity of ketchup. Yep. Uh, I think one of the ones this year was they gave cocaine to pigeons or yep. var varmints of some variety, some so, rat, and to see if it would make them more sexually active. I'm like, do we really need, does my so, money really need to be spent on that? So, so can I shameless plug here? Yes. So I ran a short lived podcast on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Julian McBain, J U L I E N M C B A I N. Oh yes. Is... I've got that on. I've got a link on, uh, on the, in the description. Okay. So if you look at the playlist, Julian McBain show, I did last year's Festivus report, the most hilarious in my opinion of which was watching lizards run on treadmills. I'm sorry. I, I, I am not joking. You're no, you're that's not a real thing. That that actually we actually paid. I think it was a couple million dollars for that. No, we didn't. I don't even believe you. It was in Rand Paul's Festivus report last year. I read it verbatim. verbatim. Why do we why do we need why do we need that information? That's a great question. I would love to know the answer. So this is why like I like this is why you know again reasons to trust the government right i just really yeah. the federal government i just don't want to give them any of my money unless it's like we're getting invaded or i don't know so like this actual this, real stuff but this is why it's so important for us to do this right the state unlike our ne our neighbor to the east new hampshire mm -hmm. vermont has a net income from the federal government the amount correct. of money we take in from the fed is less than we pay out to the fed C correct a that is we're a receiver state as correct. they say that is a bad place to be in we do not want to be a receiver state. Why don't we want to be a receiver state? Because when you're a receiver state, you're a dependent. Yes. You don't want to be a dependent. 
So what this does is over time, it'll eliminate that dependency on the federal government. That way, when the Fed says something that we don't like, we can do what New Hampshire did and say, F off. Yes, I would like to be able to do that. And the um, thing is, is that 30 years ago, Vermont was like that. What We what, used to be that state. What do you think changed? Do you think it's the influx of people from out of state moving here? Um, or That's do you, part of it. Like a demographic shift? Part of it's the demographic shift, but there's also a culture here. So mm. Vermont culture is very much help your neighbors. Yes, yes. And always has been. Yeah. Unfortunately, what happened is we ended up with an influx of folks from various other places. Um, and so to be fair, there were a lot of in the state too, but, and it tends to be urbanites who think this way. Yeah. Um, where it's, it's not help your neighbor. It's since if, if I help my neighbor, I help one person, but the government can help everyone. Yeah. Because they're everywhere. And it was imported from French intellectuals about 50 years ago. And the idea was that people should not, uh, the, the short term was if, if a person can help a person, then the government can help everyone and they can, they can better organize people to help each other, mm. which sounds great in theory, but in practice, very obviously doesn't work. We have hundreds of examples of why that doesn't work. Yes. And the, 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 the COVID pandemic is the best example so far thereof. And so, yep. We imported yep. that from French intellectuals. And then we had, during the 20th century, of course, you had that whole dichotomy, dichotomy between the capitalist West or the mixed economy West, technically, and the communist Eastern Bloc, where we had this, this pall of fear. And then after the Eastern Bloc fell and that Iron Curtain came down, a lot of those ideologies were imported directly mm. into Western mainstream consciousness. And they said, well, yeah, there's a lot that didn't work and it all collapsed, but what if these pieces work? And, and so that started getting implemented. And so the idea was as well, okay, so capitalist systems built huge industries, but it creates a lot of wealth and a lot of inequality, particularly in wealth. And that's, uh, we can get into that in just a second, but that's true. That is actually factual. And that's, that follows a natural law that I'm going to get into here in just a second. Okay. But the, the idea was, well, if we utilize the arm of government, we can even the playing field for those who end up on the bottom of the heap. Now, there is some wisdom in this, although I think government is the absolute worst agency to be able to fix it. But the the fact of the matter is, is that you're going to have that everywhere because it falls a natural law. Now, I'm not sure. I'm sure that a lot of people have heard this term kicked around. There's something that a, that a quirky Italian economist came up with called the Pareto Principle. And the Pareto principle is is the concept that a small percentage of people will wind up with the largest bulk of any one particular skill, ability, or in our in this case, money. And this is true across all industries and all skill sets. So if you look at for, as an example, the number of classical composers whose music is prevalent, and you'll actually find that when it comes to classical music, including neoclassical, modern, you know, classical music composed in the modern day. There are only four composers who make up the bulk of all classical music listened to. They're Tchaikovsky, Bach, hmm. Mozart, and uh, uh, I always miss the last one. And Tchaikovsky, I'm always embarrassed for it. Bach, Mozart, Tchaikovsky, M Mozart, Bach. Oh, my God. Beethoven. Yep. How could I forget Beethoven? Because you're a silly goose. And of the and of the large volume of works that they compose, only a small percentage of their composed works are commonly listened to. That's the Pareto principle in action, not involved with money. Now, when you come up with something that is simply a measure of value, that's all money is. Money itself is not it's not really a thing. It's actually just a measure of value that we place on it. And the mm. fiat currency we have is backed only by our own faith in it, which I think is very interesting. Um, and so when that happens... You're going to have people who accumulate a large volume of it at the top and a lot of people that have very little of it at the bottom. And it, it follows that same natural law. And this is why you can't trust the government. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, though. Um, okay, so what else, anything else we want to make sure to cover while we're on the stream today in talking about this? We're... 
So this was an idea you had. Is there anywhere we can go to do a little bit more research, to look at this, to consider it, to figure out what that would look like? So I haven't published my findings anywhere. I really should. It's it's something that's been on my, my list of things to do, which unfortunately I have not gotten around to, and that's shame on me. Yes. Um, well, you can self-publish on Amazon very easily. As I have discovered. <laughs> Um, but honestly, it just comes down to the math. Yeah. All, all you have to do is you have, you can come up with any arbitrary figure, mm -hmm. assume any form of interest rate. 5% is the average across all portfolios. Last I checked and you can Over fact time. check me on that post. So pre COVID it was around 5%. Yeah. was the, was the average return on all portfolios across the board. Um, sometimes they're as high as 12. Sometimes they're as low as one. So if you, if you take that number, take any arbitrary number, and then you take the revenue for a year that it generates, split it in half, reprincipal half of it, so it adds to the, the endowment. Take the second one, split it in half again, reduce the budget of, a, of an agency by that amount. It still grows no matter what numbers you use, as long as the numbers are not negative, because I know there's some wise, smart aleck out there that'll do that. And it will eventually cause it to be self-funding. Okay. The question is, is just how long it'll take. Well, and, and this is, and we would really have to make sure that uh, in addition, the government couldn't touch it because in theory, we're supposed to have these sort of funds for our pensions, yep. for social security, for Medicaid, and they've been mismanaged and underfunded. Correct. And, and so, and, yeah. So it can't, not only can it not be negative, it can't be zero either. <laughs> correct. And so what we can do is we can build into the law and more importantly, into the trust that the trust principle is sacrosanct mm. under no circumstance can the government dipped into the prince dip into the principle of the trust for any reason whatsoever and we can even put consequences as part of that trust so if mm. they attempt i mean we could go so far as to cause that particular legislator who had the temerity to write the bill to be arrested i i don't necessarily want that to happen but but it could be uh you lose your position or right, you we could, something we could make it so politically distasteful that, that no one nobody would, would want to do it, which is not the case in, uh, which is not the same case with our with our state pensions, that or is uh, or our Social Security or Medicare. That we there's not that protection from the trust. Correct. That's because so, our state pensions are based on. So, I'm going to use Social Security as an example. Yeah. Everyone assumes that Social Security is an insurance plan. I'm here to tell you, as an insurance professional licensed by the state of Vermont, it is not an insurance plan. If yep. you look at the design of Social Security, it's actually a Ponzi scheme. I mean that literally. The entire design <laughs> is exactly the same system that Mr. Ponzi used in order to make himself a, a, a boatload of money off of the backs of other people. Mm. They designed it the exact same way. The thing is, is when Ponzi did it, it was a crime. And when the government does, does it, it's called Social Security. And <laughs> anyone is welcome to fact check me on that. You can email me at paul 4 Senate at gmail.com with the with the receipts if i'm wrong i guarantee you if you look into the mechanics of social security that's exactly what you'll find i mean it literally is it requires um the people getting paid out it's coming from other people paying in they're yes. not getting what they paid in you get almost invariably you get more um i would be curious to know how many people like uh how many rich people can't take their social security or don't because they're so rich that they don't versus the number of people who get way more social security than they paid in. That's like, cause really if you're, question. if you're rich, can you get your social security? Isn't there like a threshold where I, I think there's a threshold, but it's very, very high. Yeah. Like, like you have to be, I think you have to have over like $10 million. Oh, intro. Okay. So it is really high. So it's, I'm really it, curious, like, how much is foregone by rich people versus yep. how much extra people get than they paid in? Well, and here's the thing. If you if you were a boomer, you got a lot more than you paid in because you might not have paid anything in. If you are Gen X and you're starting to move into Social Security age because our older Gen Xs are at that age. Yep. Then you're probably you probably won't get back what you paid in because it's designed to work like an annuity. And so, what oh, annuity? like you get basically you get the interest and dividends earned on the amount that you paid in. 
Correct. That's how it's supposed to work. But if you look at how it actually works, it's a Ponzi scheme. But the design of it is to operate like an annuity, where when you annuitize, it slowly pays back the money you paid in with the interest earned on that particular annuity until it runs out of money, which conceivably should be before death. So for those of you who don't know what an annuity is or don't know the mechanics of an annuity, yeah. I need to get into this really quick. Okay. An annuity, so two forms of life insurance. You have life insurance and you have annuities. They're both bets on how long you're going to live. Mm. Life insurance, so an annuity is a bet that you will live longer than your money will last. Life insurance is you will not <laughs> live long enough to make it to your 120th birthday or to outlive the policy. Right. The risk is borne by the insurance company in both cases. So if I have an annuity and I pay in half a million dollars and it's earning interest, when I turn 59 and a half, I can annuitize that annuity and I can make it a life annuity. And my bet is, is that I'm going to spend more than the 500,000 plus the earned interest over however long I had it before I die. And then the insurance company is paying out of pocket for my uh, behind to live until I die at the ripe old age of 150. The conversely, the insurance company is like, your actuarial life expectancy is 89. So huh. we're going to give you just enough money so that we pay you out by the age of 89. And uh, if you die before, then we win. Yes. And so that's, it, it's a little more complicated than that. But if you get down to like, if, if you, if it was two people in a, in a, at, at a bar, that's what that bet would look like. Yes. It is not a pretty thing to talk about, but that really is, you kind of have to calculate that stuff whenever you're talking about those yes. things. And I'm curious too, when social security started, you know, it was you, the average life expen expectancy was like 60. Yeah. And now it's 80. My, my actuarial 75. My personal actuarial life expectancy yeah. as a former tobacco user is 89. Wow, really? Yes. I have I have looked at the tables. Uh, that 90 years old even though like I mean I imagine the more bad things you might have participated in in the past or like if you're overweight or whatever that number would go down. I'm guessing, Correct. right? Correct. My BMI is good. I know I quit tobacco with less than 10 years of use. Um, all of those factor in. Okay. Assuming, assuming I don't. But 90? You know, yeah, 89. And by the way, I think they're wrong. I expect to live to be 150. Oh, oh, tell in me fact, more. So th this is a bet I've made with, with life. <laughs> it's like, no, I want to see, I want to see 150. Okay. I want to see. So what happened was when I went to work for the major bank I worked for, uh, one of the first things they ask you within like the first six months of working there, they actually sit down with you and go, okay, what's your career plan? What's your retirement plan? Like within six months of working for them, they're like, when do you plan on retiring? Wow. And I, and I gave them, so my, my start date there was June 13th, 2012. Okay. That's my first day in, in, in finance. It is a very important day to me. Okay. I said, my retirement date will be June 13th, 2112. Okay. My 100th anniversary with that company. What? That was my plan. And I would have okay. been 128 when that happened. And my managers, my manager didn't catch it at first. And she's like, why that particular date? And I said, it'll be my 100th anniversary. anniversary. I said, I'm not going to live that long, or at least I don't think I'm going to live that long. So you're going to show up one day. I'm going to be dead in my chair. <laughs> And it's that simple. <laughs> oh my goodness. I love it. Okay. One other question I think that's super important before we go is, um, did anybody else ask any questions? Let me see. Let me make sure I'm not missing anybody. Throw the questions at me. I want to answer them. <laughs> uh, obesity is a worse risk factor than tobacco. It's like the worst risk factor for pretty much everything. Yes. Um, that is, but that's not but we'll, we'll not talk about health today. Um, no, so the, no, I'm not big, a health expert. Yeah, no, that we do. De I definitely am not. Um, what happens if there's a stock market crash? So I, I don't know if we've covered that really yet. That's um, a great question. Yeah. So this is why making sure what instruments that they are invested in is 
is very important. Mm. But here's the thing about stock market crashes. We've experienced we experienced the crash of 29. Yeah. And then we experienced the crash of there was one in the 80s, if I remember correctly. It, it was a serious correction. Mm. And then yeah. we experienced the crash of 08 or the 07. savings and loan scandal, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Wasn't the savings and loan scandal, I think, in the 80s. So what happens consistently over time with every stock market crash? Um, There's usually always a bubble ahead of time. Um, There's there's one afterwards. People panic sell. Um, What, What happens after it's over? Oh, a recession or a depression. And what happens after that's over? Um, Everyone with diamond hands had more money than when they started. Mm, that's true. Everyone who held had more money than they... Mm. Now, there are going to be exceptions. Like, if you were... I believe it was Bear Stearns. Was it Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns that blew up? Ooh, last year? No, back during 08. Oh. Oh, God. Now you're going to make me reach for the... Ma- Everybody was having problems back then. Bear yeah, Stearns no, was Yeah, no, one of them... One. So, if... um. Like, like Wachovia got absorbed by Wells Fargo. There were a lot of, um, there was a lot of M and A, but mm. um, uh, mergers and acquisitions. That's what M and A means. Sorry. That's okay. That's remember I said if if we get too much into jargon, I'm gonna try to remember to make sure we explain to people. It was Bear Stearns. Yep. So if you had stock in Bear Stearns, yep. you probably lost your hat on Bear Stearns. But anyone with half a brain would not only have stock in Bear Stearns. Right. So this is where holding down to bonds, packaged securities, which are mutual funds, um, which for those of you who are unaware, a mutual fund is a company that only o- that the only business they, they do is they own other stocks. Mm, yes. So... A mutual fund is a, is a stock of a bunch of other stocks and bonds. Correct. Yep. Um, so if you, if you, if you want to know more about that, please go talk to your financial advisor. So, yes. Yeah, speaking of which, if anybody watching, uh, wants to learn more, you've been thinking about getting into the stock market, starting a retirement fund, something like that, send me a private message. I've got a couple of good friends that are licensed either in Vermont or Texas um, and and multiple states around the country. These two guys are one's located in Vermont, one's located in Texas. If you guys need anybody now, you are not currently we discussed that earlier. You're not currently Correct. doing that, right? I am not currently licensed to, to deal with securities. I have was previously licensed to do package securities, so mutual funds, um, variable annuities things of that nature i am currently insurance licensed yeah um there's there's a lot of mechanics that go into securities licenses and you have to work for a firm that does securities licensing right very for people and you have to be in a role that requires it of which i am not currently in that particular role plus there's there's a book this thick of crap you have to go through to get that license like the form the form to get licensed is 35 pages long wow i wish i was making that up that is a, well i mean you know you don't want some chumps to be doing this stuff so you got to make no. it a little bit difficult right no absolutely and if anyone <laughs> wants to verify whether or not i'm telling the truth you can go to brokercheck.com or gov okay you can type my name in you will find my crd there and you will see the length of time that i was licensed and with with, with which firms i was licensed with so <laughs> well, i can't blow smoke about this the information's out there yeah this is, it, this is we can tell the truth we can find it um, so, so before we go for the evening, Paul, why don't you take a moment, tell everybody, uh, you know, uh, you're running for Vermont state Senate, uh, give them, give them your details where they can find you, uh, your district and all of that stuff. So I'm located in Barry town, which means I'm part of the Washington County district. You can find my Facebook page. I believe Erica, you linked that in the description. Did you not? I believe I did. Um, you can email me at Paul for the number four VT Senate dot or at gmail.com. And I do reply to emails. I also reply to Facebook messages, um, as, as promptly as I can, I can't guarantee it will be within 24 hours because, um, I also have to, um, you know, work a nine to five job. job like the rest of us be responsible so my my facebook page is facebook.com slash valorant for vt senate excellent 
and you will find my whole platform on there, both for last year and pieces of this year's as I'm developing. I'm tweaking it just a little bit for this year's Senate campaign. Um, but largely, I'm running on the same platform as I did last year. Um, on top of retiring taxes, I also deal with education reform, education licensure reform. Uh, my big question there, and I kind of hinted at this earlier in the show, is we're spending almost $20,000 per student per year on education. The most per capita in the country. Japan spends 9000 ish per year per student, and they have far better outcomes than we do. Yes. So what are they doing that we are not? Yes, I and agree. So, so that's that's in there. Um, law enforcement reform. Well, and, and a lot of people don't realize about 75% of our taxes, our property taxes, are education funding. And yes. so if we're paying more than twice per pupil than uh, Japan, um, and they're getting way better outcomes, you know, I mean, we should be we should be graduating rocket scientists from every one of the Vermont schools, and we're not. Correct. And uh, and so if we want to be competitive in the marketplace, if we want to keep our kids here and have jobs, we need we need to figure that stuff out. So I'm, yes, we do. I'm so supportive of that, Paul. And, and here's the thing. There might be a solid reason on why that happens that way. Mm -hmm. That might not be reconcilable. Like it could be that the cost of living in Japan is cheaper than Vermont. I don't believe that to be the case. Looking at Tokyo tells not. me that's not the case. <laughs> it is definitely um, not. <laughs> but what we can do is over the course of one full generation of students, we can quite, we can slowly reform grade after grade until we only, maybe we only need to, maybe we can't even cut it down to $9,000 a student. Maybe yeah. we can only cut it down to 12. Yeah. But that's $8,000 per student per year. We're not spending mm -hmm. for worse outcomes than they're getting in another country. I don't want to cut teacher salaries. Everyone's like, well, you're going to cut you. No, I'm not looking to cut teacher no. salaries. I'm not looking There's to cut There's so much waste. No, if you talk to what any is... any teacher in any municipality, they will tell you how much waste there is. Um, I've seen it myself in Burlington, uh, in the Burlington School District. As an example, we have an aviation program at the Tech Center, which is great and admirable. Um, it graduates maybe one student per year and costs over $100,000, uh, well over $100,000. So while that's a cool thing, um, is it reasonable to ask Vermonters to pay for that when, when we're not, we're not making rocket scientists out of that program? Right. And, um, and I do want to, I want to throw this out there too. I am not suggesting that we cut special needs programs either mm -hmm. because the last thing we need are students who cannot learn in a traditional educational setting to fall short. That ends up costing us a lot more in the long run than the money mm -hmm. we dump into it at the education level. Uh, what no. I am saying is that for the general ed student who does not need a lot of assistance yeah. outside of the norm, norm, where is all of the waste that is causing us to spend so much per student? Because, I mean, we well, have some special ed schools. So, Eric, I don't know if you know this. We have special ed schools where the cost per student per year is in excess of $100,000. Now, part of that is because of what those students' needs are. Some of them have deep psychological traumas. Some of them have... Um, are need to have one-on-one -on -one support with clinicians on a constant mm -hmm. basis. These things are necessary to make sure these kids don't fall through the cracks. Am I happy that we have to spend that much on it? No. Would I rather spend the $400,000 on them now rather than the one and a half million for them to be institutionalized later? Yes. Yeah. So Absolutely. I'm not suggesting but, we cut those programs. Well, and that's they be the more thing. efficient, but... It's, it, it, well, and that, not that we necessarily cut the opportunity for different kinds of education for those kids right because a lot of times if you take them out of the traditional public education model and you put them into a charter school or something like that they often do a lot better they have better outcomes mm -hmm. they have better learning uh uh responses and all of that stuff and so by giving parents the choice to be yep. able to put their kids in an environment where they can really thrive rather than doping them up so that they'll sit still uh, yep. in a public school setting. You know, uh, we can cut that in half just by supporting homeschools and things like that where where parents really want to participate in their child's education, where they where they know that their kid is not really able to be in a traditional setting, but they don't have the support that they need for that alternative 
for that alternative. Correct. And so, and that's, so um, part of what I'd like to do is I want to loosen the regulation. So homeschooling in Vermont is actually very loosely regulated. Mm. Um, I want to make sure that we have protections for like collective homeschooling where you might have a group of parents who are all homeschooling their kids, but they yes. all specialize in something. So, you know, the six kids go to, to, to you know, Mrs. Black's uh, house to learn math. Yep. And, and Mr. Green's house to learn science and, 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 you know, so, you know, Professor Plum's house in order to learn uh, <laughs> astronomy. Oh, so, so that your, 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 your teachers are from the game clue. I, I, I had to come up with random names that would not be actual people. <laughs> so. Okay. But, hold on. Hold on. We're totally going off on a tangent talking about your Senate campaign. I'm going to have to have you come back. No, it's okay. I asked you to talk about your Senate campaign and then I totally encouraged it. We're going to have to have you come back on um, when we get into election season and we'll, and we'll have some good debates on policy and stuff like that. Yes. I would I love, love it. that. I love it. All right. Let's take a minute. Paul, stay with me. We are going to end the live stream here in just a minute. Let me make sure I didn't miss any good questions. Hands off homeschool. That's right, Miss Olga. So um, can I, I can I just throw out here for just a second, Erica? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So anyone who wants to ask me questions you didn't think of during the stream again, yes, please feel free to email me. Reach out. Paul at uh, Paul the number four VT Senate at gmail dot com. That is my official campaign email. I do try to have a turnaround on that email. That's relatively quick. Um, I'm not sure Olga would necessarily agree with me, but um, okay. For the average email, I do get back to you within within 48 hours is my attempt. Um, sometimes uh, within seven days, if I haven't emailed you, come back and say, Paul, I Call emailed again. you. Okay. Um, Sounds good. Because sometimes life gets away with me, but go ahead, Eric. Yes. I apologize. No, no, that's great. I, that's good. Um, so we'll have all that contact information. If it's not in the description, we'll make sure it's in the comments for you guys. Um, Paul, I'm going to... I'm going to boot you out of the stream here for, for just for the end here. Um, yep. and I'm going to torture everyone with our book, uh, video. I'll, 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 t I'll take you out so you don't have to be associated with the absolute ridiculousness everyone is about to witness. Thanks for having me on Erica. It's been a Thank pleasure. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Okay. So this is, this, is this the rough cut or is this the final cut? Of the is this a rough cut this is a rough cut of the commercial we worked on for our ridiculous book do you want to come be in the stream with me baby no do you want to come say hi to all of our our no, guests no. and to see our book okay all right everybody here so this is the uh international debut of the uh book commercial reasons to trust the government by lord and lady reddick this book will give you wings. wings! What kind of wings? Not like Icarus wings, like Eagle wings! wings. Yeah. What about dragons? You'll have dragon's blood! You'll be able to breathe fire! Fire like the Ultra Eagle Dragon Guard! This book will make you smarter! Smarter than who? Smarter than everyone else on Earth! Yes! I'm not just talking honorable smart, I'm talking Nikola Tesla Smart! You'll be so good looking, Brad Pitt will be jealous! Do you want to make money? How much money? Elon Musk money. That's a lot of money! People will think you're Elon Musk, but you're not Elon Musk, but they'll think you're Elon, Elon Musk because you pay taxes like Elon, Elon Musk. Musk! And you have to argue with Elizabeth Warren because she thinks you're Elon Musk. Musk! Do you want freedom? How much freedom? All the freedom! Uh, uh. I love freedom! From one to America, how much freedom do you want? America! D D Double America! Uh, yeah! Freedom! <laughs> okay, I'm actually putting you back in the stream. <laughs> uh, I'm sitting here backstage dying in my chair. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to put you back on because I saw how hard you were laughing. <sighs> oh my god. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. 
Okay, I just, we were like, how can we make this the most ridiculous over-the-top commercial that we possibly can? And so uh, we we just had a really good time, and uh, Benjamin's edit is amazing. I just have to give him the credit for that. Uh, so it was awesome. All right, all right, we're officially closing the show, you guys. We'll talk to you next week. Don't forget to come back to talk about, uh, to see what we're going to say about the uh, annual Festivus. Uh, thanks to Mr. Rand Paul. All right. Bye, guys.